But these revelations are not just a blow to the department's reputation, or, but they also affect our ability to keep the country safe. Ms. Goodling would not let a former U.S. attorney from Western New York, Mr. Battle, hire his own assistant because she believed that his preferred candidate had not proved himself to the Republican Party. Another qualified New York candidate, a winner of the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, was rejected for a top Justice Department counterterrorism position because of his wife's Democratic political affiliation. So this is not just politics. This is our own safety. One of the most shocking conclusions in your report is that someone like Monica Goodling, who politicized the appointment of assistant to U.S. attorneys, immigration judges, and even counterterrorism positions, may not face any real consequences for her actions. So let me ask you this, Mr. Fine. Should such blatant politicization and illegal activity be subject to some criminal punishment so there would be ultimate accountability? I'm not sure she, it's true to say that she uh, escaped any, any accountability, any punishment, as I discussed with Senator Whitehouse earlier. Uh, she, she, people did leave the department, uh, so they can't be disciplined by the department, but, but we've recommended that they, they never get a job with the department again, and hopefully never with the federal government again, that they consider this report if they ever do apply. Um, they have been exposed. Uh, their, their conduct has been exposed in a transparent way for all to see. And then there may be, I'm not saying there is, but there may be appropriate bar sanctions for possibly for attorneys uh, who, are, uh, who have committed misconduct and may have violated a bar rule. And so um, uh, the bar may, may look into that. Um, and with respect to the consequences of these violations of federal law, can you identify what bar rules might have been broken? Did not see OPR making any referral to disciplinary counsel as a result. So. I'm a little confused about uh, what disciplinary consequences lawyers might face. My understanding is, and I've had discussions with OPR about this, that OPR intends to and we will participate in a notification of, of the bars of individuals who are found to have committed misconduct for them to review, review the, the conduct. Now, I don't believe OPR has done a, a, uh, a lengthy review of this and say which exact rule, but, but it does intend to, I think it is appropriate, to notify the bars of the uh, individuals who are involved. And I th in fact, I think uh, some of them have already been notified. I've read that uh, individuals have provided our reports to various bars for the bar to, bar to look at. In terms of the rules, I'm not an expert in the area, potentially Rule 8.4, which talks about uh, uh, the administration of justice and, and acts uh, uh, going to the fitness of an attorney to practice law. I'm not saying that necessarily does apply, but I think there are things that um, ought to be reviewed and looked at, and the experts in this area ought to, ought, to, ought to do that. Would you think that it might make sense to strip from individuals hired pursuant to a deliberately flawed process the protection of those civil service laws until they had gone through a legitimate process. It strikes me that if something like that were set up, you know, this isn't done just for fun. This isn't done just because somebody has an idle hour. This is done in order to achieve political ends. And the end is to put certain people with certain ideology in certain positions. And if the folks who are going about doing that were understood that by virtue of distorting and compromising the civil service hiring process, they were actually denying the folks that they'd be planting in the civil service positions the benefit of civil service protection, it would seem to me that it would operate as a counter incentive to these sorts of attempts to suborn the, uh, or subvert, I should say, the civil service system. Would you? I have to think of more about that. that. That's an interesting um, uh, proposition. It takes uh, the prize out of the game, basically. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to sort of answer that, that question off the cuff. It's an okay. interesting well, proposition. Well, I would say that I'm not sure that all of the individuals who were selected knew about the improper procedure that was used. Maybe some of them did. I'm not sure all of them did. No, and to a certain extent, it would be their uh, bad fortune to have been on the losing end of this. But from a structural point of view, it would take away the incentive the prize, if you will, of the game for those who are manipulating or compromising the civil service process to political ends. That's true. That's one way to do it. Uh, I would hope that uh, the department would do it directly 
and to prevent the people from actually doing this so we don't have to get to this um, yes, that would be after best. the fact uh, review, but uh, I understand we your, missed your that point. We missed in this case. Yeah. Um, the last question uh, that I have has to do with um, you indicated on a number of occasions in this report that people gave uh, statements to you in the course of their interviews that you described as inaccurate and in some case described rather pointedly as inaccurate and in what looked to me to be circumstances in which it was a little hard to believe that it was an innocent mistake. Um, and my question to you is, are the interviews that you conduct within the ambit of 18 U.S.C. 1001, the False Statements Act, and do you have a process for evaluating whether inaccurate statements provided to you in these interviews amount to a false statement under that act? And what is that process for such inaccurate statements? How, well, do, you, how do you get from you just saying it's inaccurate in the report to a referral of some kind for some prosecutive official to look at whether that criminal law was violated? Well, they are within the ambit of Section 1001, a false statement to an OIG investigator is covered by that statute. Um, and uh, we do analyze that. We analyze whether the evidence is uh, sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the statement both was inaccurate, the very specifics of the statement, and you being a former U.S. attorney know the difficulty. You have to be very precise about what the question is and what the answer is, and it, it has to be inaccurate and all, false in all respects. And then we go to the sort of the intent of the person, whether it was a mistake or whether they, they knew it was inaccurate, or we can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. So the same um, processes that an assistant United States attorney would use, and we do have assistant United States attorneys, very experienced ones on our staff who have done this over their careers, uh, do that analysis. So is it safe then to conclude from the report limiting itself to only describing these statements as inaccurate and not making any further referral or not discussing uh, any further whether the statements might merit prosecution, that you did in fact look at that and that the conclusion that you drew was that these statements, uh, however inaccurate, did not amount to what an assistant U.S. attorney preparing a charge would consider adequate uh, to bring that charge under 18 U.S.C. 1001. That's correct. Okay. 